You have called for uh, impeachment proceedings to be initiated against President Trump. What do you say to those Democrats who say, look, this is not the time. It's going to take away focus from winning in 2020. Speaker Pelosi told her caucus again just today that she has no plans to immediately initiate impeachment proceedings. So there is no political inconvenience exception to the United States Constitution. Um, <laughs> this one is, if I can, I want to take a little time on this because I think this is really important. Um, uh, last Thursday, uh, I'd been out, I'd been to South Carolina. Uh, this was all about climate change. That's where I was, South Carolina, coastal communities that were protesting offshore drilling. I then came to Colorado, um, the biggest drought in 1,200 years. And then to Utah, where they had one of the worst wildfire seasons in a generation. And I'm on an airplane coming back and the Mueller report drops. And so I start reading it on the airplane. I read it on through the evening. I read it into the wee hours of the morning. And when I get to the end, three things just jump off the page. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, an independent, a libertarian, a vegetarian. <laughs> three things just totally jump off the page. The first is that a hostile foreign government attacked our 2016 election in order to help Donald Trump. The evidence is just there, read it, footnote after footnote, page after page documentation. Part two, Donald Trump welcomed that help. So on the first one about what they did, understand, this was a sophisticated attack. They attacked part of the voting system. That's going to be an ongoing federal investigation. They hacked into more than 50 computers at the DNC, the DCCC, a very serious attack. And Donald Trump welcoming it um, in the Mueller report. Just read it. Uh, he gets off the phone from an unnamed caller and looks up and says to the other person in the phone, there are more leaks coming. Um, the idea that he was welcoming what was happening from the Russian government. And by the summer of 2016, the report documents that by that point, the Trump, administ uh, the Trump uh, campaign actually had a worked out formal process for dealing with the leaks that were coming in from the Russians. So that's part two. Part three is when the federal government starts to investigate part one and part two. Donald Trump took repeated steps aggressively to try to halt the investigation, derail the investigation, push the investigation somewhere else, but otherwise keep that investigation from going forward and turning into a serious investigation about a hostile foreign government that attacked us and about his own personal interests. So here's how I see this. If any other human being in this country had done what's documented in the Mueller report, they would be arrested and put in jail. Obstruction of justice is a serious crime in this country. But Mueller believed, because of the directions from Donald Trump's Justice Department, that he could not bring a criminal indictment against a sitting president. So I think he's wrong on that, but that's what he believed. So he serves the whole thing up to the United States Congress and says, in effect, if there's going to be any accountability, that accountability has to come from the Congress. And the tool that we are given for that accountability is the impeachment process. This is not about politics. This is about principle. This is about what kind of a democracy we have. In a dictatorship, everything in government revolves around protecting the one person at the center. But not in our democracy and not under our constitution. We have checks and balances. And we have to proceed here in a way, understanding our place in history, that not only protects democracy now, 
but protects democracy when the next president comes in and the next president and the president after that. But, but That's just, our responsibility. But you started off by saying, by talking about some of your travels and people talking about climate change and their concerns yes. and tabletop issues. Yes. Doesn't putting a lot of Democrats focused on impeaching the president, which is not gonna pass in the Senate, it's not really gonna go anywhere in that sense, doesn't that take away focus from the tabletop issues that you and other Democrats say they want to run on? So, you know, let me just say, if you've actually read the Mueller report, it's all laid out there. It's not like it's going to take a long time to figure this out. It's there. It's got the footnotes. It's got the points. It collect, connects directly to the law. But this really is fundamentally, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And so did everybody else in the Senate and in the House. And I believe that every person in the Senate and the House ought to have to vote and to say either, yeah, that's OK with me. Yeah, let a president just step in the way he did when he told the White House counsel to go fire Mueller and then told the White House counsel to go lie about having told the White House counsel to go fire Mueller, and then told the White House counsel to write a letter saying that Donald Trump had not told him to go fire Mueller, and then to say, why on earth would you take notes about what I said to you? The lawyers I deal with never put anything in writing. If there are people in the House or the Senate who want to say that's what a president can do when the president is being investigated for his own wrongdoings or when a foreign government attacks our country, then they should have to take that vote and live with it for the rest of their lives. Um, I want you to meet this is Cecilia Darms. Cecilia is a sophomore at Harvard from Columbus, Ohio, studying social studies. She interned for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Cecilia. Hi, Cecilia. Hi. Uh, you were registered as a Republican until oh, 1995. Uh, but you've since become one of the most progressive people in Congress. Did you change your beliefs, or do you believe that the political parties changed around you? So understand this, Cecilia. I grew up in a family that wasn't political. I grew up out in Oklahoma. And to this day, I couldn't tell you how my parents were registered, or my grandparents, or much of anybody else. Um, my mom always voted. Uh, I know that. And in fact, she worked at the polls sometimes. But we weren't a political family. And when I was a young mom and <laughs> struggling to try to keep up with my job and get dinner on the table and take care of a little couple of little kids and launch my career, I didn't think much about politics. Now, I've been a policy person for a long, long time. So I think the question you're asking me is, when does the change come? And that I can tell you. So in the late, mid-1990s, I've been working over and over and over on what's happening to America's working families, to America's middle class, how it is that people who work hard, who play by the rules, are just finding the path steeper and rockier year by year, and for people of color, even steeper and even rockier. This is my life's work. And so I keep working on this about what's changing in America. I'm studying families that go bankrupt. And the credit card companies, half dozen giant credit card companies figure out that if they can get the bankruptcy laws changed, that what will happen is they can improve their bottom line by just a little, by keeping people locked out of bankruptcy. Never mind that those people are head over heels in medical debts, that they've had job losses that have put them way behind, that they've had a death or divorce in the family, that they've been cheated by credit card companies and mortgage companies. Never mind any of that. Just improve the bottom line for the credit card companies. Man, I looked around in the middle of that fight, and I realized <laughs> all the money was on one side, and all the hurting was on the other. And that's when I jumped in politically. I got in that fight, 
And I fought it for 10 years. And by the end of that fight, I fully understood that every single Republican stood there for the banks and half of the Democrats did. So my party was the party that at least we got half of them to stand up for working people. And that was the big change for me.